Good evening, I'm Matt Ralph. Tonight on Talking in Stations, Fraternity drops a keep star in Aquarius, 8QT Tech H4. That borders Delve. Ashtarothi writes, what happens next? We'll ask him if Jida gets invaded by Triglavians. And finally, Provost Marshal Valkanir, the leader of Edencom, put out a public me message to the Capsuleers. Those stories and more on TIS Today, the EVE Online Report. Let's get started. How are you doing, Astrothi? Greetings. I am doing pretty good. It has been a pretty crazy couple of days. Um, been busy trying to get everything understood quickly as things are changing every day and get information out to people quickly in a way that uh, like people can digest because there's a lot changing. And the more people know, the more people can stay safe and the more people can make money off of what's uh, you know, the invasions. So you wrote an article today. Where did you release that? Well, I kind of originally wrote it as just like a Google Doc, um, and I didn't know if I was going to like record it or whatever, but I just knew I just needed to get this information like brain dumbed out. And I started showing it to more and more people, and I had some corrections and additions, and it started to end up just being this pretty decent document. And ultimately, I posted it in like Twitter and uh, Reddit. And then finally, I realized, uh, actually, I can post directly onto the forums, and it like copies all of my markup and links and stuff, everything from Google Docs into the forum. So it's there now. <laughs> 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 that was a that was a wild revelation. I'm going to use the forums way more now. Yeah. I like how those uh, spectacular dis uh, decisions of distribution boil down to what holds my format. It, it, I mean, one of the things about having ADHD is it's kind of like, well, just just get it down, just do something, Ash, and then we'll just work with whatever ends up, ends up being the product. Yeah. Well, when you're delivering as much content as you deliver, that's got to be one of the essentials. But let's talk about the content of your, I guess, uh, announcement here. What did you say in it, and uh, what should we know? Yeah, so uh, as I believe yesterday, I kind of came on and said a little bit, uh, Invasions is officially like over. They're, as the 27th liminal system was secured, uh, the remaining system that could have gone liminal instantly fortified, the, per the remaining uh, invasions fizzled out over over the next two days, and now uh, there are no inv uh, active invasions anymore. And uh, I've also spoken to CCP a few times in regards with this and talked with a bunch of other people about what's going on, and this is pretty much where we're at now. So uh, the Triglavian Collective was going after 27 solar systems. These 27 solar systems will be distributed among their three groups or you know subcultures subgroups called clades um, each one of them will get nine systems what this means for these systems we're not sure one thing that uh, it did happen was this morning the the text the string text about the stargate being shut off and how this might be for some time uh, that was added to the tranquility this morning which got a lot of people excited um, but we now know that like, as we move forward, what we now have as New Eden is pretty much what we are going to have going forward. One of the things I wasn't sure about yesterday, which I've gotten more confirmations about, is that minor victories are not going away. Um, and so these disturbances to transportation that is caused by having either Triglavia minor victories or Edencom minor victories will continue. Um, so not only will Niarja continue to be a final liminality and therefore probably transportation between Jita to Amar to be inaccessible for the foreseeable future. We also have a, a, a variety of other systems that are disrupted. Uh, Castlemon is a fortress. There are several fortresses, I think five or six fortresses between the Jita Amar route. Um, or fortresses are minor victory, income minor victories. So depending on which side you end up aligning with, there will be certain systems that are very difficult to travel through, um, while other systems will be just fine. Yeah. We we'll talked um, about that. So if you're going to the market, for instance, there'll be a, pl a way that Edencom goes, and there'll be a way that Triglavians uh, sympathizers go. Right, right. And, and you can always uh, like right-click on systems that you want to uh, and avoid them, so that that way the uh, autopilot will hopefully reroute you without adding too many jumps. Um, but uh, ultimately, there there will be some long-term adjustments necessary because this is this is pretty much the way it is. However, we also have seen a big change in what sites are distributed within these systems. So um, I 
I categorize the sites in the invasion systems as tier zero, one, two, and three. Tier zero is soloable. It is the old emerging conduits, and the Eden conversion would be Eden com forward post. Uh, the tier one would be the minor conduits or the staging areas. Tier two would be uh, major conduits or field bases, and t uh, tier four would be. Um, oh, sorry, tier three. Uh, shoot. I lost my place. Uh, tier three would be um, the uh, like the world arc proving conduit and uh, observatory flashpoints. Which you so it used to be that like those higher tier stuff only sh ended up later on in invasions, whereas the earlier stuff showed up either outside of invasions or um, like in the earlier stages of invasions. And uh, the tier two sites are basically almost like a raid encounter that ha is up from where somewhere between like five to ten players usually um you could actually th it's what i used to run all the time for my stream uh was tier two and tier three sites and now those sites are what's available in fortresses and final liminalities so uh those who are loyal to the triglavian efforts can now run tier two and or tier three yeah tier two and tier three sites at will and tier one sites in the fortresses um and pro edencom people can run the observatory flashpoints in the world arcs all of their sites uh in the final liminalities but of course those are null sec so uh that'll be interesting for those people to have to uh engage in those sites uh it does actually mean that both sides will be able to farm the dreadnought basically uh effectively freely at this point so who knows what that's going to mean for availability for the zenitra dreadnought um because now, rather than having to chase the invasion and only hit it like at its highest notes in order to run a few dread sites, these dread sites are going to be available basically forever in these uh, in these uh, set systems in the fortresses. Right. Yeah, and that dreadnought so, uh, recently got a buff, so there's going to be a lot of farming of ingredients to build it. I imagine. Yeah, yeah, and both sides are required to farm to to actually build it. Uh, one gives the blueprints, the other builds uh, gives you the materials to build it. So there's just a just an, a ton of changes to just both the challenges and the opportunities that exist in uh, high and low security space. It just seems like CCP has taken a lot of the work that they did and rolled out in stages, and now they're kind of accommodating it for future use in more permanent ways. What well, I mean, ultimately, all they did was end invasions, and they made an adjustment of which system, like they moved some of the sites. Basically, up before this, the tier zero, one, and two sites were all spawning in the minor victories, and so we would just run minor victories for money, and then we would run stellar reconnaissance for like to decide whether or not the system would go liminal or not. Mm -hmm. um, now it's like if you want a solo farm or like really small group farm, you can do it in a minor victory. But if you want to do this raid content that uh, like I used to do in my stream and some several other people have liked to do, there are lots. There are now what, 53 fortresses? Now, admittedly, some of them are in LOSAC, but uh, there are a lot of these sites available for anyone who wants to run an incursion-style fleet. So what are you preparing us for? You say, look, this is what you should prepare for in the future uh, for this uh, article that you put out. Or well, this is what's next. Oh, um, well, I mean, ultimately, we, we're not 100% sure what exactly is um like coming after this there's a couple of things that have people really excited like i said the stargates uh being shut off and the potential of like uh not just one but three different new triglavian organizations that we could in, in theory work with or against uh clearly this is not the end of uh edencom or the triglavian efforts this is simply the end of the invasions i kind of uh jokingly said that uh, the, yesterday that the invasions are over. Now it's time for occupation. <laughs> so uh, we'll have to see as those develop, as each of these uh, groups of Triglavians, each of them have their own uh, desires, drives, and goals. Yeah. Can I ask you what you think of the Edencom FC Arcia? That's Baleful Dysnomia, isn't it? Yes, Baleful Dysnomia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, I said yet uh, I said last time and I'll say it again like really truly the uh, almost the MVP of the whole invasions like there have been lots of hard workers and everything but uh, 
what they did, what they they and their crew did was basically they didn't want either side to win, right? So if you were pro Edencom, you could just push the bar until it got Edencom victory, and then you won, yay! And if you're a Kybernaut or Triglavian, you know you pushed that direction, yay! But what they did was they didn't want anything to do with invasions. So if an invasion occurred within Mimitar space, they would disrupt in the the effort of both sides until 48 to 72 hours passed. And if neither side wins within 42, 48 to 72 hours, then this is, uh, then the invasion would just end. So one of the things you'll notice is, is that a Mars space has a lot of uh, Edencom minor victories. E Edencom rats, the Amarian rats, were just really, really good at fighting uh, the Triglavians. Uh, by contrast, the Kaldari space has a lot of Triglavian victories because uh, Kaldari rats are horrible at shooting, uh, at fighting Triglavians. Galente is kind of a mixed bag, but Mimitar space is oddly kind of clear, especially Mil Mimitar Losek. Uh, Skarkon, which is an incredibly important system for a variety of reasons, um, uh, it was, I think, one of the only major systems to actually fall within that whole area. And so uh, Baleful uh, and the, uh, her crew managed to take a whole different aspect of the invasions and push for a different objective than either of the ones that were given, you know, were said, oh, you can be red or blue. And they chose to be the, the third path and managed to be very successful in doing so. So I think that that's probably the most impressive story that comes out of the entire invasion arc. So keeping uh, uh, her area was uh, Minmatar space, keeping Minmatar space as much of the same as possible, not letting it go to Triglavians or Edencom, but just keeping it the way it was, which is also right. a choice. Right. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't supposed to be a choice, but if, as I said, it was designed so that if neither side won for some period of time, the invasion would time out. And so they uh, jumped on this and said, well, in that case, we're going to make sure that neither side wins anything. Right. So not to participate is a choice in this scenario uh, that they took, essentially. Well, there's a lot of participation. I think that they, uh, they following her Twitter, uh, they got really good at uh, tornado ganking for quite some time, from my understanding. Because they, like, they, it was an interesting um, challenge because it was competitive PvE, right? Like, at a certain point, like, uh, Niarja was a really good example. Uh, Nyarja stayed totally stable for like four, four or five hours. The, the, the needle didn't move in either direction by even more, uh, even a percent or like the smallest of a, of an, I think it's 1%. It was the smallest amount. Um, and the reason why was because you achieve points when you killed your rat, the opponent rats, like when you scuttled their fleets and when you finished the site, that's what gave you points. It didn't matter about the actual killing of the rats. It was the ending of the sites and the in the scuttling of the fleets that triggers the points. So, uh, and these things only respawn so fast. So, when you have four hundred people in the system and they're killing every single rat the second that it spawns, um, both sides have maximized their points. And so, you literally cannot progress without disrupting the opponent team. It's not enough to simply do your job. At a certain point, you have to be able to disrupt the uh, opponent team. And while in the low level, uh, Ology is valuable, anybody who's been in any level of large fleet fight, who's been in any fight of, that's like over 100 people know that at a certain point, Logi becomes kind of uh, not as impactful to the fight as you would expect. So, uh, you know, you can Ology all you want, but then when they get blapped off the field, it doesn't matter. So um, what ends up happening is in the, the truly combative fights, they have to uh, amount to creating uh, teams of suicide gankers uh, as a way of trying to disrupt and um, stop people's efforts, uh, which, I, which was one of the reasons why I kind of chuckled at what happened in Niarja, because, of course, when Goonswarm came into Niarja, they showed people what suicide ganking was all about. Yeah, they've been proficient at that for a long time since Burn Jita. Um all right. So I think what I was trying to say, though, was there was option one, option two, and they took and made really option three, which was neither one or two. And they preserved their territory uh, as much as possible. I think we learned yesterday that they only had two systems that were overturned uh, for Triglavians. And whereas as far as Triglavians are concerned, Amar had four, 
Galente had four, but uh, 16 in Caldari space, which is astounding. And you explained that, right? Yeah, um, it really, well, again, so the, uh, when, a, when a side, get, or when a fleet gets scuttled, or when a site gets completed, um, then you gain points. And there's only so many sites, and they only spawn so quickly. And it seems or, that the belt rats or the, the roaming packs ended up being worth more, ultimately, for control than the sites were. You can run the sites as fast as you want, and if they control all of the belts and kill all of the enemy belt rats and, kill, and save all of theirs, you will lose. In fact, that actually happened to me. Um, so what, what would happen was, even if you ran all the sites the rats themselves would run into each other and fight and kill each other. So in the early days of invasion, the Cald well, all of the uh, Edencom rats are based on the home rats of that empire, right? So Galente, Caldari, Amar, um, uh, Mimitar. And the ships themselves, like it's all the same kinds of ships, like they have a hack and they have an um, uh, electronic ass assault or electronic attack frigate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, all of their resist profiles is the standard T2 resist pro profile for that race. And it just so happens that Caldari's standard uh, T2 resist profile has 0% EM. And you may think to yourself, Ashrathi, the Triglavians do kinetic and explosive. Everybody knows that. But the problem is, is that uh, Triglavians have um, liminal missiles, right? So they have they're, one of the types that the rats can have in these invasions is they can have these special extremely high EM kinetic missiles so they can just blap the uh the uh Kaldari? the caldari rats yeah. and they're designed to be high alpha right it's designed to be punching you directly in your hole so if you're not ready for it it's an extreme spike of damage so when your em resistance is zero that spike is extreme and the the rats just aren't quick to deal with that and so the caldari or so the triglavians are able to kill caldari rats just fine mm -hmm. meanwhile uh while jams are handy um, it doesn't actually disrupt things broadly, whereas uh, the Amar actually can newt out the Triglavian's ships. So that turns off their their uh, props, it removes their uh, E-War, it removes their remote reps, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. So um, the Amar rats were extremely effective at killing Triglavians. There was a rebalance about halfway through, but it was insufficient. It was still true that the Kaldari have, are notoriously bad at fighting the Triglavians. You really have to babysit them. Yeah. And by contrast, you can fight as hard as you can against the Amar, and it still may go against you. So EM is electromagnetic, uh, one of the damage types. Uh, it's very interesting. So by, by virtue of the mechanics, Kaldari were at a disadvantage against Triglavians. That's why a lot more systems were chewed up in their space, which is interesting. Okay, yep. the big question for you. We've seen some stuff leak out of the test server. What's going to happen to Jita? Uh, you know, uh, okay, so all I'm going to say is the same thing I've been saying for like six months, which is that in the Chapter 2 trailer, they show Jita fully constructed. Looks like a giant um, space castle. Yep. Yeah. And then in the next frame, it's the same structure, the same Jita from above, and there's a shadow passing over it. Um, I know that Invasions was kind of expecting to wrap up around the 7th anyways. I have no idea what series of events is going to lead between now and the 7th, but I still stand by the idea that... October 7th? Uh, the th yeah, October 7th. Yeah. I, I personally stand by the idea that the big plot twist is that the attack on Jita is not by the Triglavians. Well, who the... Well, you've got lots of players. You've got Sancha, you've got Drifters. There's, there's, there are lots of people who, could, who are pros and ready to make some sort of strike. Uh, could be the Trig, but the thing is, is that... Uh, so the, another thing that got added into Hobo Leaks is a whole bunch of... Um, uh, NPC names. And while some of these NPC names are leaders of like powerful organizations like uh, Kaldari Mega Corporation, it's the daughter, no, it's the daughter of Midular, who's the, le the former leader of the Mimitar uh, Republic. Um, a lot of the NPC names were the leaders of the old Dust Corporations, which leads to all of this stuff that they've been talking about for over a year when it comes to planets and mercenaries and all these kinds of things, um, which is that 
these these mercenaries have been associated with this conflict, these invasions, um, and uh, its results, and in tangential plot lines for like the last year or two, um, strongly hinting of it leading towards something. Scarcon was actually a big part of that, interestingly enough. Um, you can check it all out in the world news. But uh, if if invasions is over, the question is what is going to be the next chapter? Um, and the other important thing to know about the dust clones is that m the majority of or the early templars the people who eventually became these these foot soldiers these sorry my bad i should take a step back these clone soldiers are like immortal uh foot soldiers while we are like spaceship pilots these are foot soldiers um and they have their own cloning technology but the problem is is that this cloning technology was originally developed off of ancient sleeper technology and uh there's this super evil uh, rogue artificial intelligence that's known as the other that has taken over the sleepers civilization and uh, has used uh, Jamil Sorum, the former empress of the Amar. I know I've gone way down the rabbit hole, but <laughs> it's okay, bear guys. with me. Still following. Uh, uh, used her to cause uh, this huge explosion, which led to the formation of or, you know, the causing of wormhole space, but more importantly, then went in and started harvesting these implants so that way they could create the first immortal soldiers known as the Templars. This is really important because not all the Templars were destroyed and not all the dust soldiers, like in the early days, what happened to a lot of those soldiers and whatnot was always in question. And there is actually a chronicle where basically the others mocking Jamil and saying that there's no way that she'll ever catch them all. And so he used this program to kind of allow fragments of himself and other sleepers and whatnot to be trapped or escaped out of the... Uh, out of the construct, out of their matrix. Um, and so all of this stuff with like the ghost ship and the and the different um the angel cartel fighting in the Mimitar space and the various different dust organizations that are being called in here and there, Mortis Legion being uh called out for using war clones for secret investigations in Vale, right? Like they've been building up all of this storyline for what will happen next. So it my guess would be that you know all of this has been built up, and and the big twist is is that the enemy that we've been like they they tease the shadow, but it's not the enemy you think it is. So that's oh. why I think it's going to be like Sancho oh, or something. Interesting, a little yeah. Even for people paying attention, it might be a little surprise. I uh, brought up a page here on Amazon since that's kind of a bookstore online of uh, the Empyrean Age, which is the first book written in 2009 about faction war, and it describes a lot of what uh, Ashrathi was saying. And its sequel, Eve Templar One, talking about those land-based uh, immortal soldiers. That's their origin story, but that is a sequel to the first book. So those two can be read uh, sequentially. Uh, I recommend the Empyrean Age. It's really good. It kind of gives you a background on Eve Online and how things are laid out and how Faction War actually started. All right. Speaking of Sancha, uh, when the Triglavian invasion started, uh, I guess the second quarter of last year sometime, uh, they cut back on the Sancha incursions to, uh, because, because of, I, I guess, server resources that were diverted to the invasions. But are those going to be going back up to three? now that invasions are over i haven't heard either way about that um as i said there's going to be like this there's kind of this new on tap uh raid system that i think that people will want to digest with um the relationship between the triglavians and uh the incursions are is very interesting and um the so yes Obviously, there is a mechanical or there's a reason why they remove incursions, right? Like, or they reduce the number of incursions. And I believe the real reason was more that they wanted to uh, kind of emphasize in invasions more. Um, but the, in addition to this, the Triglavians actually hate Sancha. And in the World News articles, several times, like an incursion would happen and then an invasion would happen right after this. And these facts are called out in. Uh, the world news in a way that's kind of like we're not sure what exactly is going on, um, and perhaps the Triglavian, some of the Triglavians are in fact hunting after the Sancha. There's been a long and com complicated um, kind of a lot of uh, 
speculation involved with this. And one of the interesting things is in the latest update, Sancha is one of the groups that have now been added into the Abyss. Previously, they were mentioned by the Triglavians extensively, but we had never seen them in the Abyss. And we had never seen their behavior with them too much in, um, in known space. But um, it is very possible that the reduction of incursions and the future of incursions will relate to this ongoing story of, Sancha, or of the Triglavians' attempt to exterminate the, the Sancha. Right. So uh, in related news, we have a communication from Edencom Provost Marshall, uh, and she says that they're monitoring Triglavian movements, and they still want to emphasize the evacuation of civilizations that are in the systems that have reached full liminality. And uh, there was actually, uh, we were talking about Arcia or uh, Baleful Dysnomia earlier, and how she led uh, or was part of a group that went in and and role played evacuating a Minmatar planet. Uh, so that was, uh, and CCP played along, which was kind of interesting, but uh, they are still talking about being on alert and evacuating those, those uh, planets that have uh, full liminalities on there. Do you, what, what do you make of that kind of thing, Ashurathi? Uh We're going to have to see where this is going. Um, because the problem is, is that there's so much propaganda and so much lies in the feed of what we're given that it's really hard to tell. Um, I mean, there's even some suggestions in the world news that what the Triglavians are doing to the people may be a positive thing. And just me saying that out loud may, may seem like I'm like a Triglavian sympathizer or something like that. <laughs> That's the kind of the state that we're at at this point. Yeah. But, um, uh, you know, the, the thing is, is that they were doing human experimentation uh, prior to um, Invasions Chapter 3 as well, um, it's, there were several systems. There was, that's why there's talks about the, uh, the, the secret bases being discovered on stormy planets where they were doing, they're modifying humans in order to try to make them uh, more hospitable or whatever. Uh, we're still not 100% sure what is, what is going on in that way. But also the, uh, the suits that we all just got, this, or the rewards, to mm -hmm. the top tier, uh, pro Triglavian supporters, they got the new combat suit. And it says in the combat suit that there's some special stuff wired in that's designed to begin this transition to being a Triglavian. So I think that, you know, there's just something about the nature of of their space. Like Abyssal Dead Space is rough and whatever else is in the domain of Bouillon is probably not much better. And so, you know, they wear these suits to keep themselves together and to to mutate themselves or whatever it is that they do. And so they're trying to they're trying to bring these people up to speed, as it were, um, by hook or by crook. So um, I guess it really depends on what your opinions are about the Triglavians, about whether or not you feel that's a good thing or not. Yeah. Uh, there are new, um, new outfits and new clothes that were just distributed to players that have participated, right? Is that what you needed to do? Right. If you had any standing at all, you got one reward. If you had at least 1.0, you got a different reward. 2.0 is a a different reward and then finally at 3.0 you got the full the the big suit thing 3.0 of what points or yeah standings, standings. so you oh, standings. every every time you yeah every time you did something that would push like a system or you know finish the site um in a minor victory you would mm -hmm. get um either you get edencom uh standings or triglavian standings and then lose the other one interesting enough this standings was never affected by any of the skills or anything like that so that way you couldn't like game it to go up both or anything like that like it was locked on. If your standings with uh, Trig is three, then your standings with Edencom is three, pretty much. Three or negative three. Three and negative three, yeah. Okay. Because, uh, yeah, you can't be friends with both, both at the same time. Correct. If you're, yes. Trig is three, then Edencom is negative three. Okay. Thanks, man. Thanks for walking us through all that stuff. If you want to stick around, please do. We've got a little bit more news to take care of here, Ash. Um, but thank you. Well, yeah, uh, one other thing I want to point sure. out that while this does make Rakavine and Beznazine pretty available uh, now in these fortresses, these are new it asteroids? is worth. Uh, yeah, these are the so in Triglavian sites they have new they have a different type of rock that can spawn. In tier zero and one sites, there's Talasite. In uh, tier two, there's Rakavine. In tier three, there is or tier one, whatever. <laughs> uh, Beznazine and the flashpoints. Um, 
And Rakavine is noteworthy because it actually has Morphite in it, uh, which has made it incredibly valuable uh, to mine in HiSec, especially since you can respawn these sites by running them, and therefore you can mine them indefinitely. However, with the ore changes coming in October, all of these rocks are getting all of their extra ceph removed. It is worth noting that they will be, I believe, the only source of isogen in HiSec. Right. That's I now, think that was the only other thing that I didn't talk about. Yeah, and that's now going to be reserved for uh, low sec mining, which is very dangerous. So this might be a good way to pick up some isogen here and there. Right. Okay. And again, for those that are worried about the um, new resource changes that have been announced for October, that this is the baseline that they will uh, CCP will add mechanics for for mining that will give you rare stuff that you might need in different ways. We don't know what that's going to look like at all. But again, this is the most barren the mining distribution will be. Uh, after this, it, it should get a little more interesting. Well, well I, what I will say to that is that while the Triglavian invasion may be over, the occupation has only begun. And it's not like Edencom is going to be like, well, everything's fine now. And uh, across the board, all of the empires seem to be getting ready to go uh, to war once again. And uh, war is profitable and causes them to look into new forms of resources. So we'll have to see what happens. Yeah. We were joking actually today because uh, I think it was Trash Talk Tuesday yesterday. They were talking about how war isn't that profitable. And we're like, if you're fighting the war, probably not profitable. But the guy behind you that's selling you stuff, that's profitable. Empire's going to war is very profitable for us. <laughs> awesome. All right. Stick around, Ash, if you can. Um, Next, we're going to talk about the Fortizar in uh, 8QT TAC H4 dropped by Fraternity yesterday, right after downtime. We expect that to meet its full 24 hour cycle uh, in about, what, 12 hours? And at that point, we may end up seeing either a big fight uh, or not. Let's go to. Yeah, it was a Keepstar, not a Fortizar. I'm sorry, did I say Fortizar? I meant Keepstar. Yeah, much different. Let's actually go to uh, Dotland and have a look at it. What can you tell us about it? I, not much that I really know, only that it belongs to Fraternity and that it was dropped at some point dur this morning when, in during the time when Chinese people are likely to be awake and active. In their time zone. Well, this is a neighbor, actually. It's right here. It's a neighbor of 49. Uh, tech yeah, it's uh, it is uh, right next to 49 TAC where there was that super capital fight a week ago. Yep. And it looks like I, I think this is what we want to look at when we say, why are they putting a station there? Um, well, you want to look at the jump range for super capital ships and you'll see. It's uh, it's got a pretty good range into fake Aquarius, they call it, and Delve. So let's go into Delve. And you can see the systems that, that you can hit from that system. So once they put a Keepstar in there, if it successfully uh, anchors and onlines, that these are the systems that are now within direct jump range of a super capital fleet, which allows them to leverage all that power into those uh, arenas, into these systems. That would be the first time they're they're technically in range of proper delve as opposed to just npc delve which is up here in the white and so that's a big step forward we'll see if the imperium says nope that's too close you can't live there we're going to take it out and there ends up being a big fight over it we'll know in about 12 hours right after downtime when it hits this 24-hour vulnerability moment yeah i would say that the fact that uh you're saying that it was anchored after downtime? Yeah, I thought it was. Uh, I, I'm, I honestly don't know. Uh, but that would make it uh, more likely to ha get a fight because you don't have the time limit of have to kill it by downtime to, before everyone gets logged off. And Which was really weird to me because I thought, who anchors anything after downtime? That's the worst time to anchor it because you can literally, if you get into a big fight, you have a 20, 24 hours before the fight's going to be unplugged by downtime. So I'm not sure what that's about. Maybe that's part of the calculation to say, like, if you're going to come and attack this Keepstar, 
you're going to do it at the risk of having a fight that goes all day long, which is what happened in BTAC R and why you had 20 hours of destruction. And that is a bigger risk than starting a fight with like five hours to go before downtime. So it may be an actual but challenge. If they, if they drop it right before downtime and it gets reinforced and it goes over downtime, doesn't it just like restart? So it wouldn't do them any good anyways. Uh, right? I mean, it's not like they just get it for free. What do you mean? I don't know. So, so like if they if the reinforcements like 30 minutes before downtime and somebody like refs it and they're and they're hitting it and it downtime hits, it's not like like it just resets the, the downtime timer. Right. Billy's in chat. He's saying not that's not how downtime works. Yeah, I don't know how to answer that question. Maybe Billy does. Fair enough. Yeah, but I, it was my understanding that a, a timer that was contested that goes into downtime basically effectively gets reset. So it wouldn't have made much of a difference. Yeah, no, no, it's the, the timer started ticking again as soon as the a server started back up. Well, it's interesting, hmm. but but we don't know what's what's actually uh, when it actually is coming out of downtime. Billy, if you want, you can jump in and explain it to us. That would be great. Um, in the meantime, I just want to say that one more piece of news, Bastion has taken some Sov and Esoteria. Let's actually go have a look at Esoteria. I like seeing that because it means that they're trying to go and on the offensive and not just sit around and delve and wait to be attacked, which I think it's better to see them trying to hit the invaders at in the invaders home well these are tcus I, territorial claim units i don't know how important those are but yeah see all yeah, the they're not really important themselves, but the fact that they're doing it is uh something i like seeing right well we'll see how concerned uh test is about that sort of a thing um I think the same thing has been going on in drone regions, right? Hasn't initiative been harassing uh, uh, places in drones? I'm not sure. I don't know about the initiative, but adversity has been doing a lot of stuff in horde space. Oh, and have they been hired? I wonder. Don't know. I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was some sort of under the table arrangement, but a few months ago, adversity was doing the same thing in initiative space uh, in March and April, actually uh, right before uh, the Imperium decided to go on a campaign against snuffed out. Hmm. So there was some speculation that, that was part of what provoked that. All right. Well, we just have a few more minutes. Uh, Vili, can you explain uh, when that Keepstar was dropped and what the plan is for that? As soon as you can hear us. Well, as he gets accommodated there, one last thing. Russian Thunder Squad leaves Dark Side and joins AAA. We haven't heard of uh, Against All Authorities in a long time. Are they reconstituting? That would be pretty uh, exciting. Sorry, Russia? I couldn't hear you there. Uh, one second, Billy. Uh, Dark side. Uh, sorry, the Russian Thunder Squad leaving for AAA. Yeah, they they had been in Dark Side for a a bit. They had left uh, Volta when Volta had. De they kind of had a decline, although they seem to have reco recently recovered from that. So, and. They were a, they're a longtime Volta Corp, and they left for Darkside, which lives in Geminate and likes to harass Horde and a few other nearby groups. Hmm. Well, I wonder if Against All Authorities, like, it looks like it's starting to pick up there. Yeah. And well, we'll see. We'll Runder, Russian Thunder Squad what well, spent their first six years in against all authorities so that's inter interesting that they might be coming back yeah reconstituting we'll, we'll check it out keep an eye on it okay billy can you explain the uh the keep star in what was it eight qt yeah i mean what you're looking at is the next step of the invasion of delve well you have uh, to speak up you're a bit quiet 
But what you're looking at is the next step in the invasion of Delve. The 8, Q keep t eight Quebec Tango Keepstar will be the launching point of the invasion, quite obviously. Wow. Uh, we know it's in a significant moment. Did it get dropped after? Do you expect a battle on its anchoring? We are unsure. Goons have uh, posted an op for it uh, very early and then pinged an op and then uh, sent out a uh, a kind of herf from, I was, and it was probably Asher, I think. I'm not sure who sent out the, the, the hype ping. Uh, but it is a very poor time zone for uh, the Imperium. So it's hard to evaluate how they will treat the timer and how uh, it will go. So we yeah. will see. But they they put up a pretty fierce resistance. I think, was it uh, a Fortizar that went down a couple days ago that Fraternity put down? Yeah, Fortizar? Uh, yeah, they, uh, they formed 900 dudes in... Uh, you know, uh, Asia time zone and uh, Sino Jam the system and so on. We never planned to to do anything for the Fortizar, so we we were quite happy with them just kind of putting you know their you know telling all your guys to log in for something that we weren't really worried about. Um, so that and it gave us a kind of a good measure of their strength in uh, uh, AU time zone with uh, a couple hype pings and stuff because I think they hype pinged almost four times for that Fortizar which is more than they've actually hype pinged for this Keepstar. So it, it's hard to judge how they will react to it. Our expectation is they're going to try something like tornadoes or maybe some sniper dreads at mixed spots. Uh, it, it's hard to evaluate what kind of tactical play they're going to try and make. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm in here right now just watching as Asher's off making pings. So uh, th they obviously intend to try something probably with uh, range tactics. My expectation is not that they will take a super cap battle. Um, as I say, we, we got a good indication of what they could form in AU time zone uh, two days ago, and it's not even enough to match fraternity plus AOM in that time zone. So, uh, and that doesn't cover, you know, test horde, pandemic, etc. So I, I just don't know if uh, they're reasonably going to be comfortable taking that kind of a fight. Right. And the the system that the Fortizar was in was also Sino jammed, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Yeah. So they formed two hours early. They sign up jammed the system. They, you know, got control of the gates. They uh, set up uh, large fighter swarms in the gate, et cetera. So, it, you know, it, it's just a, a pretty heavy duty, uh, heavy duty defense that they had done for the SVM Fortizar. Right. And you own the iHub in this system, so they can't jam this system, which makes it a, a big difference, I assume. Ah, uh, yeah, it makes a huge difference. Obviously, I mean, it's in direct range, whereas SVM was not. Uh, this is under Arsov. That was not. Uh, this was us dropping a, a Keepstar with the intent of seeing it go online versus that, which was not. So you know, all all these things, uh, you know, are are relevant factors, and obviously, our intent with this one is pretty significant. All right. Well, we'll see. And this comes out when? If there's going to be a fight, when's it going to happen? I think it's 12.20, 12.30 Eve time uh, tomorrow morning in Alf Air, in 8 Quebec Tango Tech Hotel 4 on the border of Delvin Quarries. All right. We'll see if something goes down there. We'll be uh, covering it live if it does. Uh, until then, we'll uh, just keep our eyes out. All right. Uh, thanks, Billy, for filling us in on that. Really appreciate it. Ashtarathi, thanks for stopping in, giving us uh, some of your time and explanation on things going on. And uh, I want to remind you guys that I recorded a nice interview with um, Andrew Groen, who's a terrific guy and author of Empires of Eve. And I want to tell you guys, it's a, it's a good book, good read. Anybody who knows any of these players from Vili to Pro God to, of course, Matani, uh, the Big Red Boat, all those guys. This is when they were young and really hungry. So it's a, it's definitely a good it was. read. What's that? This is when I was young and Eve. This is okay. when you were young. Well, actually, you predate the book, but uh, this is when Pro God is starting to make his bones and all that. So it's really cool. It's a really cool read. And we have an interview with him that went about two and a half hours, and we'll be releasing that next week over a period of different episodes. 
Uh, our Patreon's already got a chance to listen to, to view it all and to see it all. Uh, and so did some of our staff, but we're going to hold off and edit it up so you guys can take it in digestible bites. So that'll be coming for you guys. Okay. Thanks a lot, everyone. Uh, we will wrap up today and see you tomorrow on Talking In Stations.